Hello, welcome to episode 225 of the Epic Film Challenge 2, A Thousand and One Movies You Must See Before You Die, from 1975, Dosu Uzala, another Akira Kurosawa film. And this will be a little duo of reviews of the two colour movies from Kurosawa that appear in the book. The first being this one, Dursu Uzala, and the next being the 1985 film, Ran. Now with Dursu Uzala, Kurosawa was in a very tumultuous period in his career, but also his life. In fact, tumultuous would be understating it. In 1970, he made Dodeska Den, which was a critical failure. It did not go down well, to the point where, I'm sure coupled with personal issues, Kurosawa attempted suicide in 1971. was unsuccessful, obviously, and beyond that, struggled to find financing in Japan. He felt that he was now seen as old-fashioned and that people didn't want to make movies with him anymore. And so it took an offer from Russia to come back and make another film. So this is a Kurosawa who had now faced his own mortality, or at least tried to face his own mortality, and uh, was now surely a different man and made this film in a completely different country for the first time in his career. He made a film in 70mm for the first time in his career, which is a, a big film format, super widescreen. I believe that was the only time he ever did that. And he made it in, you know, in Russian, you know, there's, it's not a Japanese film in that sense. And uh, he worked with the production company uh, Moss Film, who initially were keen to get him to bring over Toshiro Mifune to play the lead character, Dursu Ozala, but uh, you know, Mufune and Kurosawa were not on the best of terms, and Mufune would certainly not be interested in taking part in a production that was going to take as long as Dursu Uzala, which I think was in principal photography for almost a year, between 1974 and 1975. It took a long time to make, and Kurosawa was significantly homesick before finishing the film, and one of his assistants who worked with him on Rashomon onwards throughout his entire career practically, take away those few films he made before Rashomon, she said that the, this film and Seven Samurai were the two most gruesome ruling of productions. Shot all in the Siberian wilderness in very harsh conditions, you know, snow, wind, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's a really authentic film when it comes to the harshness of uh, nature. I'd never seen the film before, but I was really, really intrigued to see it. I've been wanting to see it for many years, and I was kind of holding out hope that Criterion would do a nice restoration Blu-ray of it, but it just doesn't seem to be on the cards. There was a Blu-ray release of it in Italy this year, but apparently the picture quality is not that great. I watched it on Filmstruck, which they have on the Criterion channel, but, you know, it was DVD quality, and I just wished I could have seen this film in all its glory, especially in 70mm. You know, they could really do a fantastic restoration with this if they uh, put the money up, I suppose. It might be to do with the rights and it being a, you know, a production with a Moss film. That might be part of it, I suppose. But either way, I still got a lot out of the visuals of the film, even if it wasn't in this pristine Blu-ray quality. I'm just saying it's definitely a film that would benefit from high definition in a big, bad way. This film is gorgeous. It really captures these amazing vistas, uh, these incredible visuals. And I was intrigued to see this from before because of its links to George Lucas's Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back. And maybe I'll touch on that later on. Let's get to the, the actual film itself, Dursu Uzala. The story of Dursu Uzala, let's set it up. It's based on a book called Dursu Uzala by a Russian soldier who I can't tell you the full name of because I don't know it. I only know, you know, the, the name that he was called throughout the film, which was... The captain, basically. But also Arseniev was the name that I saw a few times in the subtitles, so whether that's the correct pronunciation of this guy's name, I don't know, but Arseniev it is. And he was a Russian soldier who uh, was out in the Siberian wilderness in the early 1900s doing a topographical expedition. He was a map maker, uh, surveyor, and was going through the woods with his men and basically mapping out the place. And the film opens with him uh, after these events, he is reminiscing on those days in uh, 1900. And so we follow you know, his, his memories, basically, and, and he frequently narrates throughout the film his thoughts on the, the expedition as it um, progresses throughout the film, and we go through his memory. And they're all around the campfire one night, him and his, his, uh, his men, his soldiers, and they hear a noise out in the woods. They think maybe it's an animal. And then we hear someone go, no, it, it, it's people. And that's a term that becomes very um, uh, emblematic of the unique um, dialogue of the main character, Dursu Uzala, who's this 
this kind of old man who comes out of the darkness into the film and becomes the main focus of it practically instantaneously. He's an, an old hunter. And at first I thought, being a Japanese film, that, uh, you know, being made by Kurosawa, it's, I guess you could say it's a Russian film, but, you know, uh, being from the source of Akira Kurosawa, I thought that this was a Japanese actor and maybe even a Japanese character. Uh, he had the facial appearance of, of someone uh, from Japan or China, but I think it's more towards China, obviously, because being in Siberia, the location where the not just the story is set, but the real events is right on the, the Chinese border, I think. So it was a, a Chinese character, but I'm not too sure if he was Chinese and spoke a little bit of Russian, because Dursu Azala's um, speech is kind of truncated. Uh, it's simplistic, and he uses the word people a lot. But he also uses the word people as like an object, you know. That's bad people, you know, things like that. But he has this weird syntax, which maybe George Lucas might have taken a little bit from and used in a certain character in a sci-fi fantasy film he did in 1980. Maybe we'll get to that later on. So Dursu Azala, he comes into the lives of these soldiers in Arseniev, and they, they find him funny, you know, comical. You know, he's this kind of old, wily hunter who, you know, is, is a man about the the woods, basically. And he claims to kind of know his way around and, and kind of be a, he's basically a man of nature. You know, he's a hunter, he's a tracker, he's apparently effective in doing all these things and knows his way around. And so Arseniev asks him if he will help them and guide them through the woods. And he agrees. And again, at first, they look at this, this man, Dursu, and they... You know, they find him a bit funny, you know, he can't really help us, we're soldiers, we're, we're capable men, you know, we don't really need this old geezer, you know, this kind of short squatty man to kind of help us do anything. And throughout the film they, they start to realise that there's something to this man, you know, he'll say, hey, there, there was two men who camped here, two old men, uh, yesterday. And they're like, well, how can you tell it was old men, come on. And he's like, well, young men walk on the toes of their feet, you know old men walk on their heels, so that's how you can tell. And he knows all these little things, all these little intricacies. There's a great scene where, just for fun, the men have rigged up a bottle and a string on a branch, and the, the, they've swung the bottle so it's a moving target, and they're trying to shoot it with a gun. And Dursu's like, this is such a waste of bullets, you know, he chastises them. And they say, well, if you're so, you know, good, why don't you take a shot at that? And he's like, will that be a waste of the bottle? He said, let me shoot the string, and then you let me keep the bottle. And they're like, oh yeah, sure, go on then. And of course he does it, because he's Dursu Azala. And, uh, you know, he begins to wow them, but particularly Arseniev. And one thing that could probably be leveled as a very heavy criticism on the film is that Arseniev's uh, soldiers, his men, they don't have much character, if any at all. We don't even hear the names of any of them. And they're just there to kind of observe, basically. And so is Arseniev in some ways. But it's really, the whole film is about this friendship that forms, this bond that forms between Arseniev and Dursu Azala this you know this proper soldier officer you know he's, just, he's got the mustache you know he just seems very kind of uh, typical of a soldier you know and uh you know is doing this this very serious mission and then you have this kind of you know this little this little old man who just is you know he's got this bandana on he's got his rifle he's got his walking stick and you know he knows all these things about the animals and stuff and he's very uh in tune with the idea of the forest being ruled by a god and all that kind of stuff. He's spiritual, there's a playful nature to him. And so it's just such a stark contrast between Dursu and Arseniev, and to a lesser d degree Arseniev's men, but we really focus on uh, this Russian man and, and I guess Chinese man, but he calls himself a Goldie, which could be, you know, for all I know, a, a racial slur at this point. I have no idea because there's so many different... Um, uh, types and classifications of, of race in uh, Siberia, China, and, and those areas in the uh, in the in the east. So I'm not too sure, but either way, it's it's these different cultures. And I loved how Dursu Azala's kind of fractured way of speaking became such an endearing quality to him, uh, for me as a viewer, but also to Arseniev. And again, it's all about this bond that forms, but also it's about this uh, driving theme of man versus nature. And you have these soldiers in Arseniev who are incapable of really dealing with the, the really harsh realities of nature. You know, they're capable men, they're soldiers, but they, they don't know everything. And uh, there's a fantastic sequence where Arseniev and Dursu, they go out to survey this lake, this frozen lake. And they go out and it's getting close to, you know, the sun going down. And Dursu says, I don't like it, this is this is too scary, we need to go back before we get caught. Because if we get caught in, in this area, because the wind is kicking up and our tracks are getting covered, if we don't find our way back to the camp, we'll die in this cold. You know, so they start to go back and they get completely lost. And it's this extended 20 minute sequence where 
they're trying to find their way back and they're going around in circles. Just Dursu, just Arsenia, have these two men. And suddenly Dursu says, right, start cutting grass. Cut it now. And they try and build this, basically, this fort to shelter them from the cold and the wind that, as the sun goes down. And it's just, you know, it's almost wordless to a point where they're just frantically working and Dursu keeps pushing him to just keep cutting this grass and it's so tense and you know you know that you know they're going to survive but nonetheless it's so gripping and and really highlights that man versus nature thing just the idea of us being at the whim of the world around us that we have uh, have, have been you know that we've evolved into the, you know this world that we inhabit is, is bigger than us and it's, uh, it's more dangerous than us if we find ourselves in the jaws of its most dangerous um, places. And that's certainly one of the places they find themselves in, in that section of the film. I love the way that Kurosawa, throughout his entire color career, uses the sun and the moon. And they talk about the sun in the movie, but there's an incredible shot. Uh, which is obviously some sort of special effect, where Dursu and Narsiniev are standing, looking up at the sky. And there's the, the sun and the moon. And it almost makes you wonder if that was an inspiration for the, the twin sunsets in Star Wars. But either way, that was so cool. But also there's a stunning shot of the men walking across this frozen lake, or at least walking across these frozen plains, and the sun is high in the sky, but it's dark everywhere. And I don't know how they did it, if it was some sort of optical effect, whether it was a real-life kind of phenomena, but you see the sun as this kind of golden orb in the sky, and it casts this kind of very slim line of uh, light, over the soldiers, but the rest of the, the frozen plains are in darkness. I mean, it's just, I, I need to see this film in Blu-ray. Like, I just, oh, it needs to be restored. It needs to be seen in the best possible quality. Because moments like that are just, just gripping, you know, and the way that Kurosawa would use color in some of these sequences was just incredible. Now, this film is not seen as a great film by most people. And I wanted to read out a couple of reviews that I read on Letterboxd because I uh, I was really intrigued and I don't do this often but I thought I would look at the reviews on Letterboxd by people who'd seen this film who rated it five stars and who rated it one star to see the different opinions. It turns out the people who rated it five stars didn't have much to say about it, you know, but the people who rated it one star they had a lot to say about it. So I'm going to read out a couple of those reviews for you now because I have something to say about them. So here's one. The guy says it sucks a big one. Man, what a freaking chore this movie was. It's yet another example of the book forcing me to sit through stuff that clearly is not a must-see. Is this one really heralded as one of Kurosawa's greats? Because I find that hard to believe, despite the film's 8.3 rating on IMDb. I feel like Yojimbo, The Bad Sleep Well, High and Low, or even The Hidden Fortress would have been better choices based strictly on what I've heard, as I've never actually seen any of those movies. I have a hard time believing anyone even pretends to hold this in the same esteem as Seven Samurai, Rashomon, or Ran. Hell, I don't even care for Rashomon that much, and even I can see that it's clearly better than Dursu Uzala and deserving of its spot in the book. This was just so boring, with big chunks dedicated to the characters just walking through the woods and spouting nonsensical poetic mumbo-jumbo about tigers and other old men. Whatever, to each their own, but I've officially given up trying to avoid using the word boring to describe films. When you have movies like Dursu Uzala floating around, it's damn near impossible not to let the word enter into your reviews. Which, of course, he means boring. Now, I just found it interesting, you know, is this really heralded as one of Kurosawa's greats? It, it's not. I feel like Yojimbo, High and Low, even The Hidden Fortress would be better choices to be in the book. I agree. <laughs> I don't even care for Rashomon that much, and I can see that it's clearly better than Dursu Uzala. I agree. This was just so boring. I disagree. Big chunks dedicated to characters just walking through the woods and spouting nonsensical... That is what the film is about. You, you need to be on board with this being a journey. You need to be on board with, with seeing their journey, not just being told about it, not just saying, oh, we spent six months walking through, you know, you need to see those scenes, you know. And I don't feel like it drags out anything. It's just the appropriate amount of showing this journey in every step that it shows it, in my opinion. Another review said, watching a group of men walk around the wilderness for over two hours doesn't promise much that I can't obtain by going for a two-hour hike with some of my friends. That's just bullshit to me. You can't go on a hike with two of your friends and achieve the same amount of uh, experience and uh, harshness that they go through in Dursu Uzala. It's this big journey. And also, 
the film isn't just one expedition. The film is actually split into two parts. There is an end of part one, beginning of part two in the middle of the film, smack dab in the middle. And we follow two different exposition, ex <laughs> expositions, I'll leave that one in for free. Two different expeditions. The first part is in 1901 or 1900. And then the second part of the film is 1907. We jump ahead seven years. I believe it's seven years anyway. But you, you really need the time to, to understand that they're spending a lot of time out there. I feel like it's so necessary, but I understand. I get it. I, I understand why people find this film boring. I understand why people don't like this film. Arsenia have soldiers, they're just there. You know, there, there's no characterization there whatsoever. We have other characters who come into the film throughout, but they don't really have much to add. Even when we get to the end of the film, we see Arseniev's family. Except maybe his son. I, I think his son had a bit of character to him that I thought was quite sweet, but it's really a study of this friendship and this bond that was a real true life story of these two, two men from completely different walks of life. And it's about that juxtaposition of someone who comes from the established world of technology and things moving forward, living in a town, you know, living in a, a reality where they can record stuff. There's a scene where Dursu's voice is recorded on like a gramophone, you know. Technology be beginning to become a part of civilized life. And then the people who have lived in nature their whole lives. And Dursu has a tragic backstory, you know, he's someone whose family was lost to smallpox. He wanders the, the wilderness alone and does these jobs and hunts animals and and lives the only way he knows how, out in the wild. And that's a way of life, that's a way of life that so many humans have been through and have been over the whole period of our existence on this planet. And the film is about the, the differences there because towards the end of the film, Dursu's eyesight begins to fail him and Arseniev brings him over to live with him in the town and he can't handle it. He hates it, he, he, he can't believe that there's a place where you, you can't just put a tent up wherever you want, where you can't just chop any tree down that you want, where you can't just fire off you know, rounds of ammunition wherever you want. He, he can't uh, stand living in a house. There's a great scene where he just says, I don't understand how people can just live in a box like this. So it shows you that, but it's also this bond that forms that is uh, so powerful to me. That is the key to the film. Here's why I loved it so much. The first half, we see the 1900 expedition where, you know, Dursu becomes a part of the group and they all begin to love him in their own way and Arseniev becomes very fond of him. And then he has to go home and they go their separate ways. A great scene on the train tracks where, you know, they say goodbye and they're walking off and the, the Russian soldiers start singing a song and then Arseniev turns around and there's Dursu off in the distance climbing up the hill and he turns around and he shouts out, Capitan! And he turns around, Dursu! And it was just a really sweet kind of got me in the chest kind of moment. Like, oh, that's really sweet, you know. And then end of part one, beginning of part two, we flash forward seven years. Arseniev has returned to the wilderness to do more surveying. And in the narration, he says that in the back of my mind, I was always hoping that I'd get to meet Dursu again. But how could he ever guarantee that he would meet this man in the wild again? You know, and he's, he was there for months and nothing. And then one day, one of his men comes up to him and says, there was some man... Uh, outside the camp who was asking about us and asking what the name of the captain was and Arseniev kind of is like well you know did you tell him where we were and his man says no we're, no of course I've this military operation you know I, I wouldn't give away our position like that and suddenly Arseniev realizes this might be Dursu so he runs off and the cool part of it is that in the second expedition it's a new crew so no one would have known that, it, that this was Dursu so he runs off into the into the bushes into the trees he's trying to see if he can find Dursu and Nothing, you know, it's like, oh man, you know, he could have been just there. And then suddenly, right in, in the edge of the frame, you know, just, just off in the distance, through this little gap in the trees, we see this familiar, short, stumpy man walking through the bush. And then Arseniev spots him, and he says, Dursu! And Dursu says, Capitan! And I'm welling up thinking about it. I... They rush towards each other, and there's a big log in front of them. They can't reach each other, and they, they run down to the other end of the log, and they grab each other, and they hug each other. And they're just laughing. They're so happy to see each other again. And it, it just, ah. Oh. When it comes to emotion in film, you know, there, there are movies where you can be manipulated by a character dying, or, or maybe even children of a character dying. It's very easy to make someone really feel emotional at a film and feel sad by, by killing characters and doing things like that. But to make someone emotional because they're happy at what they're seeing. I was so joyful. I, I was grinning from ear to ear. Tears were forming in my eyes. And it's a feeling that's so rare. 
you know, it's easy for me to get that lump in my throat, that, that rising in my chest about something that's sad in a movie, but to get it about something that I'm so happy about, that they got to see each other again, that this was a true story, and that it was seven years, and that there was this friendship that formed, and there was a possibility, a very high possibility they would never see each other again. I, I, I just was so happy. And then that night, you know, his crew, which had never met Dursu before, they were off singing a very nice song at the campfire, but in the other end of the frame, we had Dursu and Arsenio sitting together, just, just smiling at each other, just, just laughing at how great it was that they got to see each other again. Oh, it was so fucking sweet. It was beautiful. I loved it. I live for moments in films that, that give me that feeling, and it was just, oh... That, that just made the whole film for me, you know, it, and, and it wasn't like I was so ridiculously invested in their, their friendship, but I, I guess that the, the building of that friendship for the first hour and 20 minutes or so really made me feel it, you know, but also it made me think of, you know, just in our own lives where we have friends who we see a lot and we take them for granted, you know, but if you don't see them for months, you see them again, you really appreciate that time more. And so it speaks to that, it speaks to the characters in the film, but it also speaks to you as you're watching it, and how you perceive uh, things that you take for granted. It's impossible to, to, you know, never take things for granted. You know, you're always going to take things for granted. You know, we drink water every day. Every now and again you'll get that kind of period where you haven't had water for a very long time, and you drink a cold glass and it's amazing, you know. Whereas for the most part it's just boring and tasteless and water. We always take things for granted, and I think that that includes friends and family and loved ones and you know, this is a love story, you know, it's a love story between these two men and uh, it's so sweet. And as the film progresses towards its finale and Dursu is failing in health, you know, you can see where it's probably going to go. In fact, no, it's not even a spoiler. Dursu dies and uh, I'll tell you why it's not a spoiler because the film opens with Arseniev trying to find Dursu's grave. He goes to this town and he says, I'm looking for the grave of my friend Dursu. You know, th th there it is. And then we flash back and we see the story. So you always knew that he was going to die, but I figured it was going to be a bit more involved. And tragically, it was, it, was, it was more throwaway, which was really sad. I won't give away how it happens, but, you know, basically, uh, we end the film with Arseniev uh, at Dursu's freshly, uh, you know, filled-in grave. And there was something really interesting about how the film is bookended like that. The film opens and ends with Arseniev at Dursu's grave. At the beginning of the film, it's three years after his death, and he has a wistful smile on his face, and he says simply, Dursu. At the end of the film, it's still very raw, and he says Dursu in a very mournful way. And so it, it's speaking to the, the process of grief, you know, and how, you know, time does heal those wounds, and you're able to kind of remember things uh, and not, you know, be consumed by the grief. I mean, it's impossible to move over a death instantaneously, of course, but it shows you that, um, that that grieving process and, and, and time healing things does, does work, but it's intriguing how Kurosawa shows you the, you know, the, the three years after first, and then ends on the, the raw kind of immediate um, experience of that death of a friend. Uh, and I guess it's the perfect way to end the film, and it, uh, and it moved me again, and I, and I, I kind of cried. And that's another thing, crying in films, you know, but my, t my eyes welled up and a couple of tears did, did drop. And so I can't think of a film that has made me cry in happiness and sadness. Ever. Is this one of the greatest films I've ever seen because of that? No. You know, uh, is it one of Kurosawa's best films? No, I don't think so. I'd maybe put it in the top ten. You know, maybe a push top five, but probably not, I think. I think Kurosawa's strengths as a filmmaker are more in the um, more theatrical uh, films that he's made. You know, Seven Samurai and things like Throne of Blood or Ran, you know. This is a much more kind of intimate and, and simple tale, but it's told so powerfully in this very simple, easy to understand dynamic of two people from two different walks of life who go through this experience together, and it's only helped and bolstered by the fact that it was a true story. And it just, uh, it, I, I can't wait to see it again, you know. Uh, great visuals, you know, uh, and, and two, I wouldn't even say two great characters. I think Arseniev is, is, is very bland in a lot of ways, but Dursu has enough character to hold the whole film. The actor who played him was just incredible, so fantastic, and I don't think he did many films, but he is so memorable, and it, it 
kind of begs the question, you know, what would have this film been like if Toshio Mifune had played Dosu? I think it would have been a lot different, and as, as great as he is, as much as I would have loved to have seen another Kurosawa Mifune collaboration, I think the actor who played Dosu was so perfect that uh, he was the one to be in the film. I like the stuff with the tiger, you know, and how, how much Dosu holds reverence for the tiger and how that plays into the story. The river sequence was riveting, you know, uh, just... I mean, I was so on the edge of my seat throughout that whole sequence. And, you know, this, this, this actor who was, I think, 50 or 60 when he made this film, jumping off a raft and grabbing onto a tree branch in the middle of this, you know, uh, big current river was kind of a cool little uh, action star movie moment, I thought. But, you know, this, the, the tension from that scene. But it is, it is a slow-paced film. It's a slow-burning film. Is it a film you should see before you die? Yes. Now, it's not an easy yes. It's not a, oh yeah, definitely. But if there is just the smallest chance that you could react to this film the way I did, everyone should see it. I can't guarantee that though, you know, it's just one of those things that hit me. And maybe, sadly, it might not hit me the same way again. But t today, you know, I watched it this morning, today I'm holding on to that feeling that the film gave me uh, this morning, you know, uh, when very simply put, these two friends are reunited and, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm getting emotional thinking about it. Just, It was just so awesome, you know, that uh, they were so happy. You know, Dosu, Capitan, you know, ah. Oh. That, that's one of my favorite moments in film history now. Fuck it. Like, that's just, that's what films are all about. And Kurosawa, this is the final Kurosawa color film I've seen. And I've spent the past two weeks watching all of his color movies. And I think it's one of the great periods of his career. I don't care what anyone says. A lot of people say that it's that this film marked the decline of the quality, and it's just what are you talking about? You know, it, he made some incredible films, and they're so wildly different from Dodeska Den, you know, to this, and then to Ran and Kage Musha, and then Dreams, which is so fucking completely different, and then uh, Madadaya, which is like almost an Ozu film, Rhapsody and Orga. I just love all of his color films. I really do. Uh, well, maybe not Dodeska Den. That one was a little more wanting, but. You know, he did some incredible work in the later half of his career, and I think that some of the films he made when he was 60, 70, 80 rival the best work of some of the people who, you know, working in their prime in their 30s and 40s. You know, uh, what an incredible filmmaker. And it's been such a joy to watch all of those films for the first time, except for Ran, I'd seen that before, but even that felt like a rediscovery. So I'm one very happy film fan right now who has just watched seven films that I love, or six films that I loved. You know, the seventh one, Dodeska Den, not, not so much. But yeah, so uh, look forward to, if you haven't seen it already, I'm not sure when I'm going to post it or not yet, but I'll be doing a Kurosawa in Color marathon. I have done a Kurosawa in Color marathon, and uh, that'll be a big video. And I'll talk about this film for a tiny bit in that too, but that's my thoughts on Dursu Ozala. I, 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 I'm just hoping, praying, that Criterion release a Blu-ray of this and do a great restoration, because I would love to see this in high definition. I just, I can't wait to see it again as well. I just, uh, I might go back and watch that sequence with the um, building the shelter in the, the, the windstorm on the frozen lake. That scene was just so good. And maybe I might watch the scene where they reunite again. And that's another thing, is that it deals with that thing we all go through, which is death. And this is Kurosawa, who had just come off of a suicide attempt a few years earlier. And all of his films, in a way, well, not all of them, but most of them deal with mortality. Even if it, it's, it's a plot device, but also a thematic device. Uh, death is a, is a big part of all of his movies. And, and this one, with the death of Dosu and, and you know, it deals with uh, how we use memory, I think, in remembering, because this is a, a story told in flashback. Uh, at the beginning, we begin with him at the grave and stuff, uh, and then we end with the very raw scene where he's, he's found Dursu's body, and it's so tragic, and you've got the men there who are digging the grave, and they're so, like, numb to it. You know, they're like, come on, we've got to finish this, you know, sign the death warrant. And it's so flippant, it just broke my heart, you know. But it's, uh, you know, it's how we deal with, with the death of people. and But also how we can remember those good times, you know. That's something that we have, this incredible facility our brains have to remember things. And so the film kind of, you know, for me, reminded me that, you know, hold on to those things that you find special in your life. Those, those friends, those people that mean so much to you. Enjoy those times. Enjoy your Dosu Capitan moment that you can that you can have with people. But if not, you know, if you, you happen to take those moments for granted, you have the memory to remember them and to savor them for as long as you can. And that's an important thing. And that's what I got out of the film. 
and I fucking loved it. So thank you for watching. And uh, I know it's a controversial opinion, you know, but for me this is a masterpiece. I, I thought it was fantastic. Huge, huge fan of it. And I'll stop waffling on now. So thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one, which will be my review of Kurosawa's 1985 film, Ran, which I equally rambled on in. So look forward to that.